In yesterday's video, we explored the Courier's Mile, ground zero of a nuclear detonation that we launched from the Ashton Missile Silo. But if, at the end of the DLC, we chose to fire a missile at NCR territory, we can explore another zone devastated by nuclear fire. As established in previous Fallout games, the NCR has an incredibly strong presence in California. To get to Nevada, they had to take the Long 15. Once they arrived in Nevada, one of the first bases of operations that they established was the Mojave Outpost. It is here where they erected their signature statue commemorating their alliance with the Nevada Rangers. Ulysses targeted his missile towards NCR territory in California. One of his primary targets was the Long 15. By destroying the road, he would have cut off the NCR in Nevada from their resources in California, effectively sentencing them to death at Caesar's hands. If we chose to launch a missile at NCR territory, we can take the Long 15 west and up the hill towards the Mojave outpost. At the end of this checkpoint, we find a long gate, and we can now open the gate to the Long 15. We arrive in a completely ruined landscape. Smoke still rises from the ground, and we see fires still burning in every direction. Heading forward, we find the corpse of an NCR trooper lying over one of these guardrails, likely blown through the air by the nuclear detonation, and dying upon impact when he came down. On his corpse, we find a full suit of NCR Ranger combat armor. A decent set, but not nearly as good as the riot gear we found in the Divide. But we can use this to repair our riot gear. Continuing south down the road, we see a truck on fire. It's broken in half by some sort of heavy piece of shrapnel that landed on the truck bed. Scattered around this truck are three military shipping crates with ammunition inside, and lying on the ground just beyond the truck is another NCR trooper corpse. We find four more military shipping crates on the northern side of this truck, and we can move southwest where we find more burning vehicles and more military shipping crates scattered all over. But here we begin to find some aggressive NCR ghouls. Upon seeing us, they attack from a distance. These enemies are unique to the Long 15, and like the marked men we met in the Courier's Mile, these irradiated heavy troopers regenerate health the closer they are to sources of radiation. And like the Courier's Mile, the Long 15 is highly irradiated. The closer we get to the center of this zone, the more rads per second we absorb. But thankfully this time I came equipped with Ulysses' mask. After killing these troopers, we can loot a military shipping crate and an ammo box by this truck, and we see more activity to the southwest near to a gate. I was having a hard time making any headway, so I pulled out my riot shotgun and moved closer. Holy cow! Even when using a riot shotgun, the radiation heals these guys faster than I can deal damage. Even after knocking this guy to the ground and shooting at him with this shotgun point blank, it took me forever to kill him. On his corpse is NCR salvaged power armor. The salvaged power armor is signature of the NCR, and it's the only power armor in the game that does not require power armor training to use. But I quickly had to make a run for it. This gate is an entrance to an NCR camp, and the ghouls from inside began to attack. After putting some distance between myself and the camp, I turned around to take care of the ghouls that followed. <laughs> Before heading back towards that camp, I decided to loot more of the shipping crates we find scattered all over this road. We find more wrecked vehicles and more ammunition and military shipping crates all over the place. We see a sandbag barricade next to an overpass support to the south-southeast. Here we find a high-tech gun case, and like the special containers from the Courier's Mile, many of these special containers will randomly generate specific sets of gear. In this case, I found an anti-material rifle and a plasma caster. We find two ammo boxes here, each of which filled with hundreds upon hundreds of rounds of ammunition, just like the Courier's Mile. Moving east, we see that we've stumbled upon what at one time was a firing range just outside the main camp. There are sandbags all over the place, but as we creep forward to explore, we get attacked by enemies from inside the camp.
Hiding behind a cinder block wall, we can pull out our riot shotgun and then catch him by surprise. Golly! Constantly healing ghouls in power armor is not something I want to see again. Turning around, we see another firing range set up against the cinder block wall, and on it we see another nuclear shadow. Just like the one we saw in the courier's mile, and lying on the ground before it is another skeleton. Nuclear shadows are a real thing, found in our world as well. I talked about them at length in my video on the courier's mile, which you can watch here. Going around the corner to the other side of this firing range, we find another nuclear shadow. We begin to realize why most of the enemies we find here are wearing power armor. They were the only ones likely to survive the nuclear detonation. After exploring the firing range, we can move down to the main road and walk through the gate. As we do, we awaken a few ghouls. And here we find a downed vertebrate with enclave markings. This might at first surprise us and seem strange to be found in an NCR camp, but then we recall that the NCR were the ones who defeated the Enclave at Navarro. At Navarro, the NCR salvaged all of the Enclave's technology, including the device that devastated the Divide, and, likely, vertebrates like this. It could be that they incorporated this vertebrate into their fleet and hadn't had time to remove the Enclave markings yet. We find more NCR salvaged power armor, and by the time we finish with the Long 15, we will walk away with half a dozen suits. I got carried away looting power armor off these bodies, and I moved further and further east into the camp, and got surprised by glowing trooper ghouls. Someone with a big plasma weapon started to attack me. And examining him through vats, we learn that his name is Colonel Royes. But this just wasn't working. The radiation was healing Colonel Royes so quickly that my little brush gun was barely denting him. So pulling out my riot shotgun, I decided to race forward and get up close and personal. That did the trick. On the corpse of Colonel Royes, we find two unique items, an NCR beret and a full suit of scorched Sierra power armor. This suit was originally intended to come with a matching helmet, but it was cut from the game. However, the assets for this helm remained in the game files, and there are a number of mods designed to fix bugs that reinstate this helmet, which is why you see it on Colonel Royes' inventory here. But since it's not in the vanilla game, I won't be talking about its stats. The NCR salvaged power armor itself is a modified version of the T-45D power armor. It has 24 DT, which is not the most a suit of power armor in the game has, but its stats are amazing. It grants plus 25 to fire resistance, plus 1 to strength, and heals 2 points of HP over time. Unlike the salvaged power armor, however, it does require power armor training to use. But, unlike most power armors, it does not have an agility penalty upon wearing it. And it looks absolutely stunning. On the left pauldron, we see a taxidermied bear head, affixed in place with a sash held together with a golden pin. It looks gray or gunmetal. We find red paint in the cracks and yellow or gold on the ridges, giving us the impression that at one time the full suit had been painted gold or had been covered in gold leaf. We see that the power supply on the back is a green color and it has green accents all over the body. Instead of the power armor helmet, which we had to restore using a mod, Colonel Royes was wearing wearing an NCR beret. The NCR beret looks like a typical green military beret, with the difference being that it has an NCR pin on the front, depicting the two-headed bear and the California star. This is a stunning suit of armor for power armor users, but you have to launch a nuke at the NCR to get it. Ah, how frustrating! 
Colonel Roy is, serves as the boss of the Long 15. With him dead, we can go ahead and loot the rest of this camp. Beneath a tent that has only the poles remaining, we find a bunch of medical gear, auto-inject stim packs on the ground, an emergency kit filled with all sorts of medical equipment, three more emergency kits on the ground to the east, surrounded by a bunch of radex. And ooh, on the ground next to this, we see still smoking skeletons. And depending upon our New Vegas politics, this might elate or disturb us. Knowing that I caused this disturbs me. We find another series of burnt-up tents to the northeast. We can walk away with another full suit of NCR salvaged power armor. And behind these tents, we can loot a number of military crates and ammo boxes. Next to the tent with all of the medical equipment, we find another burnt-down tent with some cots inside. This must have been where they tended to sick troopers. We find the corpse of another NCR heavy trooper in full power armor on one of the beds. Some men tats on the ground next to the sky. Another dead trooper on a concrete barricade to the south. Remember what I said about walking away with half a dozen suits of power armor. Moving to the northwest, we find a metal box with another full suit of T-45D power armor. Next to it are two ammo boxes with a huge store of ammo, hundreds and hundreds of rounds. And then in a gun case next to this is the Great Bear Grenade Rifle. The Great Bear Grenade Rifle is one of the best grenade rifles in the game. It does more raw damage than any other grenade rifle, doing a whopping 15 damage, plus 100 area effect damage modified by your explosive skill, compared to 2 damage done by every other grenade rifle. It has the same number of attacks per second as a standard grenade rifle, 2.14, bringing the DPS of this weapon up to 246.4, compared to a standard grenade rifle's 218.6. It also has way more critical damage than a standard grenade rifle, having 15 critical damage compared to a grenade rifle's one. It also costs slightly fewer action points, requiring 32 per attack compared to a grenade rifle's 35, which brings its damage per action point up to 3.6 compared to 2.9. It also has significantly less spread, 0.5 compared to one which means you're twice more likely to hit your target with this sucker than with a grenade rifle. And it is a thing of beauty. Likely salvaged from Navarro, it has old world military markings on it. The stock is painted a patriotic royal blue and stamped on the side is a white US military star. Finding gear like this almost makes me wish I had specced into explosives. But again, ugh, we can only find this if we nuke the NCR. What a disappointment. From here, we can move to the southwest to explore a ruined building. This was likely bathrooms and showers of the NCR. Heading outside, we find another nuclear shadow. Heading due west of the wrecked enclave vertebrate, if we climb the hill just inside the NCR camp, we find four ammo boxes and two lead-lined metal boxes. In one, we find a lad's life and a today's physician. With the camp fully explored, we can head north to finish exploring the Long 15. Beneath the wrecked overpass, we find another completely destroyed tent, the canvas long since burned away, leaving only the poles. Here we find another NCR trooper wearing a full suit of NCR Ranger combat armor. Moving west down the road, we find a few more enemies. We can take the opportunity to use our brand new, beautiful Great Bear Grenade Rifle. We see that the road buckles up in the back of a blue pickup truck. We find a duffel bag filled with 40 millimeter grenades and some chems, and then we can take the road up to the very top. Along the way, we find a few more ruined trucks and piles of ash, and at the very top, we find a crater. This is something we did not see in the Courier's Mile. I think we can explain this the following way. The missile we launched at Ashton had been programmed by the U.S. military. The U.S. military likely programmed the Ashton missile to execute an airburst detonation. Why they would target Hopeville remains a mystery, unless of course the missile malfunctioned. But Ulysses is the one who targeted the missiles we launched from Ulysses Temple. He may not have known about airburst detonation, and so instead targeted the missiles to detonate on the ground. Hence, 
We don't find a crater in the Courier's Mile, but we do here in the Long 15. On the other side of the crater's edge, we see a ruined playground. We see one of those red rocket slides. On the ground next to the slide, we see children's toys. We also find two skeletons. They don't look like child skeletons, but I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that if we choose to bomb the NCR, we not only kill NCR, but also their children. This spot is not accessible without dying. I had to toggle the free cam to zoom on down to capture this footage. We can see exactly how close the Long 15 is to Nevada by turning around and looking northeast. We see the NCR's monument at the Mojave outpost commemorating the alliance between the NCR and the Nevada Rangers. This detonation was so close, we can see the silhouette from here. This crater is so radioactive that if we jump down to explore it, we receive an instant death. And no amount of gear or chems will help us survive. Instead, heading back down the road, we can turn north and then west to walk around to the other side of this road. Here we find more ash piles with ammunition inside. And then at the very end, pushed right up against the edge of this crater, we find a ruined truck and underneath it, another high-tech gun case. Here I found a grenade machine gun and a bunch of mini nukes. And in the next one, I found a Gatling laser. We find a food crate and then four ammo crates, each of which has hundreds of rounds of ammunition inside. On our way out, we see a flagpole next to the road twisted to the side. And at the base of the flagpole is another NCR Ranger wearing a full suit of NCR Ranger combat armor. Looks like the blast threw this guy into the air, whereupon he smashed into this flagpole, tipping it to the side and dying upon impact. With that, we fully explore the devastation that is the Long 15. Once we finish exploring it, if we return back to Ulysses, he has unique dialogue. We can say, the Long 15 is no more. The main supply line to the NCR is cut. No damage done. Not yet. Maybe in years. Keeps the bear fenced. If Kaisar can't drive it back, fire might. Only delays the end for the bull. A new wall for them to scale and cross. Once they're done with the Mojave and Hoover Dam. Never again do you or any other courier and caravan need walk that route. Let the Mojave breathe without that asphalt scar raking it. Now, if we chose to nuke Legion territory, the next time we travel to Cottonwood Cove and head down towards the water, we discover the boat to the dry wells. We see that this is the only upright boat in a line of small rowboats. We can walk up to it and take the boat to dry wells. We arrive on the shore and immediately come face to face with irradiated legionnaires. Like the irradiated NCR troops at the Long 15, these irradiated legionnaires are unique to dry wells. They too are quickly healed by the high levels of radiation emanating from the crater. Some of these legionnaires use stealth boys, and I found it difficult to make any progress against them using my brush gun. So switching to the riot shotgun, we can get to work. After these are dead, we see the plume of a helmet rise from the horizon. This is Gaius Magnus. Gaius was the first name of the original Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar. Gaius Magnus greets us with a minigun, but as soon as he can, he switches to a machete and charges us, giving us plenty of time to switch to our riot shotgun. But before we can loot his corpse, we need to deal with the remaining legionary ghouls.
on Gaius Magnus's corpse is the armor of the 87th tribe. This is a powerful suit of armor that rivals power armor. It has 22 DT and grants us plus 10 AP, 3 critical chance, and 1 charisma. This suit, unlike virtually all other Legion armor, is not made from scrap. This suit was crafted after the apocalypse, made from beaten plate, personally tailored to Gaius Magnus. On the back we see the Golden Legion Ball and the number 87, written in Roman numerals. We learned from Volpes in Kulta that the Legion had conquered 86 tribes. I assume, then, that the 87th tribe depicted here is the Legion itself. When all 86 tribes become an amalgam, together they form the 87th tribe called Caesar's Legion. And on the front, my goodness, look at this gorgeous suit of armor! We again see a golden bull, and the pauldrons are silver and outlined in gunmetal, with two huge spikes, or horns, or maybe teeth, sticking out of them. It has a pterygis, like all legion armor, which resembles a skirt protecting the thighs, but this one is black instead of red. Dry wells compared to the long 15 is a bit smaller. Just by stepping off the boat, we already aggroed all of the enemies in this zone and killed them all. So now all that's left is to explore it for its riches. By the water we see three crosses lining the road, and the skeletons hanging upon them are smoking. If we decided to nuke the Legion, we incinerated these innocents, these victims, that the Legion had crucified. Moving to the north and heading to the western side of the road, we see a bunch of burned Legion tents. The canvas has been reduced to ash, leaving only the tent poles. Here we find a ruined building with four ammo containers, each of which containing hundreds of rounds of ammunition, and lying on the ground next to them is another high-tech gun case. Like the other high-tech gun cases, we can loot a randomly generated high-tech gun. In this case, I walked away with a Tesla cannon. Crossing the road and moving to the northeast, we see the remains of what must have been a supply tent, lots of scrap and a little bit of food on the ground. Crossing the road to the west, we see a small path leading to an overlook. Here we find the remains of a workshop tent. We find tools and scrap all over, and on the ground, we find a gun case. Inside, we find a note, missing shipment, some 40mm grenades, and the red victory grenade rifle. Inside the note, we read, General, we found a seized shipment of Chinese Red Victory model grenade launchers and thought you might like to have one for yourself. They are quicker to reload than our Great Bears, but they don't pack quite the same punch. Still, it'll be nice to give those guys a taste of their own medicine, if it comes down to that, right? So this is a pre-war memo that the Legion somehow got their hands on, written by a U.S. serviceman to a U.S. general. The U.S. military had the Great Bear grenade launchers, and the Communist Chinese had developed their own Red Victory ones, which the U.S. military somehow intercepted. It only does two damage, plus 100 area effect damage modified by your explosive skill, the same damage as a standard grenade rifle, and 13 less than the Great Bear grenade rifle. However, it's way faster, doing 3.21 attacks per second compared to 2.14. This brings the DPS of the Red Victory Grenade Rifle up to 327.9, which is much higher than the Great Bear version at 246.4. The downside is it only does one critical damage instead of the Great Bear's 15, but it costs fewer action points, 29 instead of the Great Bear's 32. This brings the damage per action point up to 3.5, only 0.1 less than the Great Bear. This grenade rifle is emblazoned with Chinese communist insignia. The stock is red, and it's dotted with golden stars. Also in this ruined camp, we find two lead-lined metal boxes with more magazines and chems. And then to the northwest, we find a stash of four ammo boxes with hundreds and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Moving north, we see the corner of a destroyed brick building. Heading inside, we find a military shipping crate on the ground, and inside we find some high-tech weapon mods. In this case, I found a Gatling laser focus optics and a hunting rifle custom action. These, like the weapon mods we found at the Courier's Mile, are randomly generated. There are two ammo boxes on the ground here, a high-tech gun case with a fat man inside, and another high-tech gun case with a ballistic fist 
a Tesla cannon, and a light machine gun. Next to this is two more ammunition boxes. Heading northeast of here, we come to the edge of the crater. This, like at the Long 15, was not an airburst detonation. The nuclear missile penetrated the soil, creating such a crater. This crater actually deals more radiation than the one at the Long 15, resulting in 35 rads per second towards this crater edge. Like at the Long 15, jumping into this crater equals instantaneous death. Heading to the eastern side of the road, we find another nuclear shadow, flash burned into the side of this concrete structure. And then scaling a broken piece of concrete to the southeast, we can climb upon a rocky ledge where we find another huge cache of ammunition in four ammo canisters and a metal box that randomly generates high-end armor. In this case, I found a full suit of combat armor reinforced Mark II. Here we also find two emergency kits filled with all sorts of chems. Heading back towards the water, we can swim to the opposite side of the river. If we do, we find an overturned boat, and beneath it, we find four damaged shipping crates. These crates just have some scrap and ammo crafting supplies. If we try to travel west, we get a message saying that we can't swim any farther in this direction. And looking east, we see that this path is blocked off by rocks, so our only way in and out is to use the boat. With that, we fully explore the Dry Wells. And if we left Ulysses alive, upon exploring the Dry Wells, we find unique dialogue with him. Dry Wells is destroyed. That was your birthplace, wasn't it? No. Opposite of that. It's where my tribe was taken. Where another history was put to the blade. Lesson taught. It is where we realize Wolpus did not approach us as equals where we realized the wolf had come, and we watched our history die. Now it belongs to Legion, and all the death there now belongs to them as well. Not revenge, just the way of things when you own them. And with that, we finish exploring every new location that comes with Lonesome Road. The rewards are amazing, but we only get them if we choose what I consider to be the least ethical options, nuking either the NCR or the Legion. It's also frustrating, because let's say that you love the NCR, and you'd love to rock a full suit of NCR gear. The only way to get this suit is to nuke your own team, the NCR, and the same is true for the Legion. I've read a lot of forum posts from players who have gone through extreme mental gymnastics to justify nuking their own faction just to get their faction suit of armor. But what are your thoughts on the Long 15 and the Dry Wells? Did you choose to nuke either of them? And if so, how did you like the rewards? Our series on Lonesome Road is coming to an end, but we're not done yet. In upcoming videos, I want to take some time to talk a little bit about Ulysses and the mind behind the man. And we've got to go through a loot video to explore everything we can walk away with after completing the Lonesome Road. So stay tuned. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. If you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I recorded a brand new Lonesome Road themed song. It had a major role in episode 7, and I play part of it as the intro to each of these episodes. After viewer feedback, I'm working on getting it online so that you can download it or stream it. It may take another day or so to process, but when done, I'll be sure to update the description of this video with a link. I've also got a brand new shirt in the shop, folks. Who are you that do not know your history? On the front, we have the quote, and on the back, we have the old world stars and stripes. I also have a version of this shirt with just the stars and stripes on either the front or the back, or just the quote on the front. All of these shirts come in a wide array of colors and in a variety of sizes. I have a bunch of other designs in the shop, so if you're interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with episode 10.